Right, let's just make sure, okay. So we go between the digital dragons branding and the Pollen VC branding. Um, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Martin McMillan. I'm the CEO and founder of Pollen VC. Um, <coughs> as a company, we're on a mission to educate uh, gaming studios uh, with uh, around financial topics. So um, what we spot there's a, you know, everyone talks about user acquisition, everyone talks about monetization, game design, no one talks about finance. And yet if you get it right, that's one of the things that you can really, you know, go from, uh, from good to great. Um, so our business is providing credit facilities, so debt-based um, uh, lending to studios um, to enable them to scale uh, using paid UA. And the reason that someone's going to want to do that is because if the UA has to be funded, you fund that you can fund this through um, debt rather than through equity. So it's non-dilutive. You're not giving away shares in your company to uh, to a VC fund if you find that you've got a, a formula where you can scale using Facebook or Google Ads or whatever. Um, <coughs> so a question kind of back to you is like, what kind of games do you want to build? That's uh, kind of a pretty wide-ranging question. Now, for a long time, people built the sorts of games that they were interested in. So whether that was like hyper-casual or you know, idlers or, or whatever, it was built more on kind of passion. And what's happened over the last few years particularly is that people got way better about, you know, if you're in the business of games as opposed to, you know, a hobbyist, if you like, um, <coughs> looking at all sorts of different, look, looking at the data behind the game to help you, um, to help you build something that someone's going to want to play and, and spend money in. Um, so market research, there's some great tools, the, you know, the app panties, the app magics of this world to figure out who's doing what and where people are being successful financially. Obviously, and we're not going to get into it now, there's a sea of metrics available. Retention's the holy grail. If you can get good retention, you can fix monetizations, the accepted theory. <coughs> and then you have to be good at user acquisition or find someone to partner with who is good at user acquisition. Um, so the, the main sort of topic of what we're going to talk about today is um, different game genres and understanding the financial, dif financial dynamics behind the different game genres and putting some thought into planning what sort of games you want to build based on how much money you might need to spend in user acquisition to scale them. Um, <clears throat> so if, to start with, the, I mean, lots of talk about LTV. And LTV is really, a, it's not a number or it's not just a number, it's a journey. And what we're trying to do on this journey is to figure out a few different, a few different points. At what stage do we break even on our ad spend? And lots of people think, you know, 100% ROAS is like some sort of holy grail. It's not. It's just the point that your game has made enough money to pay for the Facebook ad that generated the user. So it's really, you know, we need to focus on profitability. And the profitability comes as people keep spending and, and playing and paying. Um, to get to whatever the ultimate lifetime value of that user or that cohort of users is going to spend in the game over time. Um, <coughs> so there's a whole spectrum of different cycles, right? So, so this isn't intended to be, you know, in any way kind of prescriptive. It's just to give some very high-level examples of the sorts of different games and the sorts of different LTV profiles, break-even periods, just from, you know, just from kind of wide industry benchmarks. Um, so to start off, the shortest one, and this is about very, very quick outcomes. You've got hyper-casual where, you know, a good hyper-casual game may break even on day five. It's peppered with ads. People keep playing. It's pretty addictive. By day five, it's broken even on the ad spend. But, and by day 30, it's exercised its kind of maximum LTV. So people are just bored. There's not enough content. Uh, you've watched enough ads, whatever. Um, but the whole thing's done after 30 days. Then you move on to some kind of more mid-core games. Again, this is very, very generic definition. Um, you might look to, it might be something where you break even day 90 um, and then the full LTV is realized after one year. So much longer time horizons, but breaking even in three months is still pretty good. Um, <clears throat> now there's lots of people moving, you know, there's a real direction trend to go, you know, for longer LTV games at the moment. And so lots of people that, for example, were doing hyper casual games have moved into puzzle games, merge games, whatever. And these typically have much, much longer break even periods. Arguably, D270 is a little bit generous, but indulge me. Um, so let's say here you're breaking even on the ad spend after nine months, um, but you expect to monetize, or you expect people to play the game and continue paying um, for two years. Um, and then right at the other end, you've got your social casino, where you know it can be like well over a year, sometimes two years before they even break even. But people will stay typically pay, playing if they find the right game for the right users. That can be you know they measure LTV in 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 years, not 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 months or or days. Um, and 
basically for each one of those games, it's got a completely different profile of how to kind of finance it and how to, to, how to scale it. So if you ever want people to play the game, obviously you need to, you know, you need to spend money on acquisition. So I think it's probably, I actually borrowed this slide from something I did back in, I think 2016 or something, um, soon after we launched. And, and, you know, there were lots of people trying to get features and just hoping that their game was so good it was going to fly to the moon. It just doesn't happen. Um, and so as part of any kind of success or scale up plan, <coughs> you've got to factor in um, paid UA um, into that. And obviously paid has to be paid for. So we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, about those dynamics. Um, so we're going to look just the high level. A lot of these things are going to look similar, but we're, we're just going to talk through um, some of the semantics behind it. So again, <coughs> you know, you invest your, you invest your you know, dollar, or in this case, 20 cents, right? So we're going to talk about hypercasual. So a 20 cent CPI to acquire, you know, my, my hypercasual user who I'm going to m serve a load of ads to, I'm going to break even day five. And then the ultimate LTV is the end of the month. At the end of the month, the user, you know, deleted it off their phone, it's all dead. So let's just look at the, the just core numbers behind it. So I've got a CAC of 20 cents, I'm breaking even day five, and I get to an LTV of 30 cents in 30 days. So I'm making a 10 cent profit. So typically kind of small numbers, but the outcomes are very short. So I'm actually making a total ROI or total return on my ad spend of 50%. Um, and then I, if I want to look at it on a monthly basis, it's 50%. So I'm making incredibly strong return on money, which is why hypercasual has been such a, you know, such a sort of darling of the industry because the, the ability to make profits very, very quickly um, are huge. If we go further down the curve and we look at mid-course, so in this one, I'm looking at a $3 acquisition cost, and it's taking me three months to break even, and I'm ultimately going to make a five bucks, uh, but it's going to take me a year to make that. So my profit is two bucks. So if I think of it on a, on a return basis, I'm making, you know, uh, I'm making two having spent three, so I'm making a total return after, uh, after the one year of 66% which again sounds pretty good, but that's taken me the whole year to make that return. So I need to divide it by 12 if I'm gonna get a monthly return to compare these different genres. So in this case, I'm making a five and a half monthly, five and a half percent monthly return. It's obviously um, way less good than hyper casual, but <clears throat> arguably I'm building longer term value. Um, and we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the, into the merge and puzzle game. So a lot of people trying to do this just now, it's because the genres become very, very crowded. Lots of people sort of, seeing some of the early success. And so in this case, we're looking at breaking even, you know, let's say I've got a $5 CPI, arguably that's too low, but keep the number simple. Um, so five bucks in and is uh, breaking even after nine months. Um, so, and I'm making a projected, although obviously it's very hard to project anything out two years, um, projected $8 after two years. So I'm making a three buck profit, but it's taking me two years to make that $3. So again, if I want to normalize that back down to a, you know, like a total return of 37.5%, but a monthly return of just 1.56%. So the, the genres are going out and the returns are actually getting lower and lower over time. So I wasn't going to do this for all of them, but I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the, into the, the, the merge category. Um, so let's just look at <coughs> the P&L earned from that cohort. So think of that cohort of, as just, um, again, a journey. So I start off and I'm five bucks in a hole. I'm five bucks down of cash from having, having to pay for that ad. And it takes me 270 days by the time I get my head above water. So after 270 days, the game has just earned enough to pay for the ad. Uh, so again, everyone like, gets super happy about ROAS break even. That's just the start. No one's eaten, no one's fed anyone until you start to generate some actual profit. So the profit's the shaded area, and that obviously comes a lot, a lot more slowly. Typically, the games will there's convexity in the LTV curve, which means you start earning money quicker and then it flattens off over time. So it's actually quite good. You earn more money more quickly in the early days, but then it flattens off. And then how, how, how flat the curve goes before you just call it um, is a bit of an art form. Um, but, you know, again, there's no point in saying, well, actually, I'm going to project an, a five-year LTV that earns another 10 cents over the next four years. It's not worth it. So you need to figure out where to cut the LTV curve off when it just goes too flat. Otherwise, you just get, um, you get in a pickle in terms of the metrics. So everyone we talk to is always talking about their scale-up plan. So typically, everyone goes into soft launch, and some people nail it, and they get it out super quickly. Some people never get out of it, actually. 
Um, and then some, and it always typically seems to take longer than you think. They're, they're going into soft launch, tweaking, tweaking, tweaking. Uh, s some of them just never going to make it. Some of them get there, and all of a sudden you get the, okay, this, the, you know, the, the, the ducks are in, in a row here. Everything's looking right. Now I'm going to spend. So this, the question always comes like, I'm going from X to Y. It's always like, hey, I've been spending a thousand bucks a day, and now I want to spend, you know, a hundred thousand bucks a day, or five thousand a day to a hundred thousand, whatever. So I'm being some fairly ambitious numbers here to make the point. <coughs> and then how quickly do you ramp up? So you don't just go from 5,000 to 100,000 in a day. It's going to send the algorithms completely haywire. So you've got to figure out, am I going to do this over a month or two months or three months? So typically, like they like you know, a slow, predictable kind of increase in spend. That's the best way to kind of you know, to, to feed the algorithms, if you like, in a way that they want to see it. Um, so then you turn the question to how much capital do I need to scale? Everyone's talking about my scale-up plan, and you know, um, you know, when it comes to it, how much cold hard cash do you need to do this? And this is really, this is really the, the point for these longer genre games. So you can come out and say I want to spend 100 grand a day because I think the market can support it, and with my amazing creatives and the rest of it, I can get to that. Um, and so, so from that, obviously, you need to figure out. At a cohort level, when is that actually going to break even? And so, and, and then you build a, you know, a financial model to show basically what your scenarios are, how much capital you're going to need. So the point I'm making here is for some of these really ambitious long LTV games, um, in this case, you want to spend 100 grand a day, you would have spent 27 million bucks, most likely of someone else's money, before your first cohort is even projected to break even. Right, so you know, pretty ballsy call. And we, we see a lot of people that say, yeah, I want to debt finance all my UA. I want someone else to take the risk on it. it it's not going to happen. Um, so, but it, the, sometimes you see incredibly ambitious scale-up plans that are hugely capital intensive, right? You see some of the you know, companies in Turkey raising 30, 40, 50 million dollar rounds, and most of it's just going to go into a massive punt, hoping that your LTV curves don't run out of puff before they actually return a profit. So. I think it's important to you know to to model out you know how much you're going to need to achieve your plan, um, and then we get on to kind of how we're funding it. So, if I just looked on this ambitious plan at my bank balance or or any any plan, what's going to happen is depending on how quickly these cohorts start to break even, it's going to require more and more cash. The deeper in the hole I'm going to get before ultimately they start to break even. Um, so there's going to be a trough of my bank balance, and this is including credit lines and anything else in there. Ultimately, I'm going to have to spend, speculate to accumulate, I'm going to have to spend a lot of money before it starts to return, and ultimately then the upward trend is there, provided the UA um, continues to fly. So, um, <coughs> so then I think about, okay, so I can do this with equity. I can go to my VC and say, here's how much you know, of a cash trough I've got. That's how much money I need to raise, theoretically. That's studio running costs and so on aside. Or, <coughs> excuse me, I can look at some different models. So first, we, the easy one is my VC. Everyone understands that. Um, the second one is factoring or revenue-based loans. So this is, this is debt financing. Um, I, I think probably revenue-based loans are the most popular one. There's, there's lots of companies that have raised lots of VC money that come up with this founder-friendly, I'm going to lend you some money, you put it into user acquisition, and I'm going to take a skim of your revenues every month for six months or whatever until I've been repaid. And those sorts of things work extremely well for recurring revenue businesses, SaaS businesses particularly, e-commerce businesses. Um, but don't actually fit uh, the free-to-play model very well because what typically happens is the repayment, the fixed repayment of those loans over six months doesn't necessarily you know, um, match the LTV recovery period. You might find that you'd have had to pay the loan back before your first cohort's even broken even. So you know, the, there's, um, there's a kind of bit of a mismatch with revenue-based lending. The next one is to go to your bank. It's the obvious port of call. Um, and banks aren't very good at understanding things like mobile gaming or... Um, free-to-play LTV curves, it was certainly in my experience. Um, uh, some of them, more in the States than here, will give you facilities where they look at your <coughs> available AR, accounts receivable, and they'll provide you a credit facility of a proportion of those. But typically, they're very clunky. They work on, work on bits of paper, uh, and they're verified monthly in arrears. So at the end of the month, you submit your screenshots of your app store portals, They, you know, and then two weeks later, they'll allow you to draw some cash. Um, publisher is a really common one. So people say, I've got this great game, but I need all this capital to scale up, so I'm going to go to a publisher. 
Um, now, <clears throat> a couple of things about it. Obviously, you need to factor in the revenue share, um, et cetera, and whether those economics work for you and what you've got in-house and what you need to buy in. Um, we ran some pretty interesting research um, middle of last year. Uh, so I heard, I was at a conference online at the time, and um, I heard a kind of like a, a, a snippet from one of the M&A guys saying that all the companies that were getting sold in the market were self-published studios. So we, d we decided to analyze the invest game uh, data and we we'd written, posted it in Pocket Gamer. And we asked this simple question, what's the primary business model of all the studios that are getting sold? Was it self-published? They, were they themselves a publisher? Or did they rely on a third party publisher to get the games to market? 83% were self-published studios. 15% were themselves a publisher and only 2% of studios that got sold, this is by value of the M&A transactions, were people who relied on a third party to publish their games. So if you're going looking for investment through a VC and your ambition is to get published, it's gonna be very, very unlikely that you're gonna sell your company and therefore very unlikely you're gonna raise venture capital. Um, and then lastly, which is what we do at Pollen, which is non-bank revolving credit, which uh, uh, basically it's a combination of two things. The credit facilities work um, they digitally verify every day all of the receivables, that it, all the money that's been earned but not paid sitting in the app stores uh, and the ad networks. And then also the estimated, does a daily revaluation of all the existing users. So all the trapped value in existing user cohorts. And those things come together and you can borrow in a very, very elastic way against them. So all five of them, you know, are valid. Um, different... Um, you know, different strategies, if you like, and, and, and the challenge is to try and pick the best one that's going to help you achieve your plan. Um, so here talking, for example, about, you know, f funding with equity versus equity plus debt. Um, this is never a black or white thing. It's never one or the other. It's always the idea of introducing cap what we call capital efficiency. So using the right form of capital for the right risk profile of project within the business. So. So if you said to a VC, I've got this batshit crazy idea, I wanna build some new game based on you know, some IP I've just created, I need $3 million to build it. Totally fine, it's at risk, it's totally risky, high, high risk, high return. But if you went and said, look, I've got a, I've got a pretty copper bottom user acquisition formula, I can make a 50% return in 100 days, I should not dilute myself and fund that through equity, I should be doing, doing it through debt. So you look at the different projects that you're running within the business and then you fund them in a different way. So this is just, again, without using any numericals, it's basically saying if I'm efficient about how I'm funding this, maybe I don't need to do the whole lot in equity, maybe I can do some in debt. And <clears throat> how, how low the trough goes for the red line, um, we don't know. It just all depends on these model, on these um, uh, metrics you're modeling and in particular how long it takes to break even and that therefore this whole kind of LTV cycle. Um, <clears throat> so just a, a few kind of points on financing LTV. Um, to execute your plan, you've got to figure out a plan of how this is going to be financed. You can't start off and then, you know, and then just run out of cash. Well, you can. Um, but if you're going to do it properly, you need to figure out a financial plan of how you're going to get from where you are to where you want to be. Um, the second is uh, cash flows are lagging 45 to 90 days behind. So you, you might you know, be clocking this on a P&L basis, but the cash won't hit your bank account for up to three months, in which case you've got to factor in how you're going to do that. Now, you may indeed have um, uh, credit lines with the advertising networks, and that's going to cancel some of that out. But again, think about, you know, if I, if I spend a million bucks on Facebook ads in January, I need to pay the bill at the end of February. If I don't break even on the cohort until September, it's a little use, but it's not a lot of use, right? So that this sort of um, these credit facilities have to be factored in when the bills need to get paid. Um, and the last thing is around, you know, you know, feeding the algorithms in the way that they like to be fed. You know, it's sustainable, predictable spread. Uh, you don't want to be, you know, going from 100k a day to zero and then ramping it up again because you're just gonna, you know, you're gonna massively um, uh, pay up for it. And then kind of lastly on this point, the idea of this, the capital stack. So what we have here is just like, it's a really dispassionate way of looking at it. You figure out you've got a UA formula that's working. You first of all use up your, your credit lines with the ad networks because effectively a free risk transfer from you onto them. Um, you use what existing cash you have in the bank. I'm not necessarily talking about venture capital, I'm talking about maybe free cash flow from an existing game. If you want, you can use your credit cards and try and use the interest-free payment. People do that less typically these days. 
<clears throat> then you use like the revolving lines of credit. Then you'd use revenue-based loans. And then right at the bottom, you'd use VC funding. So it's basically a dispassionate stack. For as long as the UA keeps working, you just keep going through that until at some point you stop. Um, key thing, sorry to bang on about it, but the longer the LTV of the game, the longer the break even, the more capital you're gonna have to finance it. So feeding that back right back to the front about what kind of games do you wanna build? Do you want short outcomes or do you want long outcomes really ambitious? In which case it's gonna take a totally different, you know, size and shape of studio and, and financing plan to do that. And then the last thing I was gonna talk about here is just like, think of user acquisition as just like your first economics lesson, demand and supply curves. So um, acquisition costs are gonna rise over time. So don't ever plan out on the golden cohort and expect that to scale to the moon without costs going through the roof, right? Now, the, the gradient of that is, you know, we don't know yet. And LTVs are going to fall as you scale. So again, you might, you know, you might be spending a thousand a day and getting some really high quality users. That's going to wane. It's going to be like concentric circles going out as you start to scale up. Um, and what you don't know until you start doing it is how is the gradient of those effectively demand and supply curves. So how quickly will the acquisition costs go through the roof when you start to scale, and will your users keep paying? And that you that's why you have to keep right on top of the data every day. Um, so typically what we're seeing, the kind of best practice there is basically continuing to buy all the way up until you're, meet, you're uh, making a minimum target return. So you don't go all the way to the intersection of the curves because your propensity to kind of mess it up is too high. But go as high as you can until you say, I'm going to make an, you know, whatever X percent is in, in your business um, uh, makes sense. And again, you know, th this, whole, this whole thing is about go back to the title of the presentation, it's like what kind of games are you building? So you have to be, you know, you, you have a lot of work to do in terms of if you're setting out to start to build something from scratch because it's not just, is this a cool game and people are gonna play it? You've gotta think through all of the, uh, all of the financial dynamics about how, you, how you're gonna get it into lots of people's hands, how much it's gonna cost you over time, and then how to do the user acquisition in a way that kind of makes sense. So my last slide here is, um, I'm just going to call out something that we've built on, and we just make available as a completely free resource on the website. Um, so on pollen.vc, there is a section called calculators at the top, and we've built a whole series of kind of free to use calculators that help you model, you know, ROAS periods, LTVs, cash flows on the back of it. So we first launched these things in 2017. We've had you know, tens of thousands of people use them over the years. We just keep refining them um, over and over again. So the whole point here is just to show you, is to kind of visualize this into an investment equation. Um, and, you know, sadly, most people won't be able to get user acquisition metrics that work, but when you can, we can show you um, how, to, how to model out the outcomes. Um, so that was going to be it from me. Uh, start roughly to time. I don't know if we've got time for any questions or if we're, if we're straight in. Maybe a couple of minutes. The more data you have, the longer term you can plan, right? So you have to make some assumptions to start with, but the reality is like, you know, you, you might get to the end of two years and find that your LTV curve doesn't flatten off, it just keeps going, right, on a linear basis. But you can't wait two years to s figure out if that's the case or not. Because in two years' time, if it's that good, people have copied it and put more money into it and all the rest of it. So I, I think you've got to make, so the more data you have, the, the longer term you can plan for. Um, <clears throat> you could, you know, we always got to really avoid over projecting basically because if you just have, you've got some golden cohort and you plan the whole thing of it and it's all, you know, skipping off into the sunset, then the propensity to lose money is enormous, right? So, you know, and particularly the longer term retention, you know, so if you're getting beyond day 90, D180 and even projecting 360, tiny variations in that can make a huge skew. So we'd always advocate be more conservative early on when you've got more data. You can, you know, you can be a bit more uh, punchy with the, uh, you know, with the planning. That's it. 
Um, thanks very much, guys. You can come catch me if there's any other uh, questions afterwards.